Welcome to Growth Island, your go-to podcast on how to be the best version of yourself. Now, let's join your host, Mess Freeze, as he interviews high performers and experts in nutrition, meditation, exercise, relationships, business, general health, and life's bigger mysteries. Today is going to be really interesting because we're going to talk about how you're going to perform at your max while traveling a lot and still be healthy. So I got the great pleasure of Martin Kammer here today. He is a kick-ass biohacker. He is an extremely pleasant person that knows so many deep details about health that really gets you surprised that you thought he would be a doctor. <clears throat> He's the guy that gets you curious about what are you really eating, how are you traveling, and what are you doing for light, and why is that special light so good for you. So I'm really excited about having the pleasure of having uh, Martin here today. So Martin, welcome very much to today's program. Wow, thank you, Matt. I'm, I'm honored by that introduction, I must say. Thank you. So if we start out like just shortly about where you're from and what do you do on a normal day? So I'm from uh, Jutland originally, so I am from the dark part of Denmark, as I usually introduce it. Uh, I live in Copenhagen, though, north of Copenhagen, and um, my life, on a daily basis is filled with a lot of activity. Um, often when people ask me how I get so much stuff done in my day, because I not only have a more than full-time job at, at EY as a digital architect, but I also do a whole lot of community building in the round of the world of biohacking. I travel a lot um, with my wife as well as on my, my own to just really explore the world of, of health optimization. So, the way I fill my day with all that activity is really by managing my energy and my, uh, you know, my performance optimization strategies on a on a daily basis. Basically. Mm -hmm. And how do you get started on all this <coughs> health optimization biohacking? So my my way into biohacking was, as many others I know of today, um, quite, uh, you know negative in the sense that I was living the life of a consulting, traveling the world, um, doing a whole bunch of interesting things with my work life, but at the same time not really paying attention to my body or my mind whatsoever. There was really just one way and that was up, 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 and that's obviously fun. Um, but one day I found myself in a hotel office in Hong Kong after having traveled several years um, probably close to what medically would be called the burnout. I was already at that time on medication for ulcers. I had, you know, severe issues with my skin. I had a little bit too much visible fat. And although everybody knows me, I'm quite thin. I've always been thin, but you know, one thing is how you look on the outside. Another, mm. feel, another way if, to look at that is how do you actually feel on the inside? And I've not been paying attention to myself at all at that time in my life. And I was 33 at that time. Um, so when biohacking appeared on my radar, which I'm super thankful and grateful for the Danish podcast Hot Disking or the radio show Hot Disking, which is actually where I heard about you know biohacking the first time. Um, like Fuchs. Exactly that. He was down at <coughs> the South by Southwest conference and, and Dave Asprey, the, one of the early uh, pioneers in biohacking, the guy also known as the Bulletproof Executive, he kind of appeared on my radar there. and. You know, the, the approach he took to understanding the human body as a system that could be hacked, you know, as such the word biohacking, was really something that I understood. Given my background in IT and, and process optimization, it was like a no-brainer for me to dive into, oh, my body is a system. Hey, I can understand it. It, it is a natural, you know, series of uh, events that leads to a certain outcome, and those outcomes can be tweaked depending on where in the process you interject. And um, so, yeah, that's that's really how I got into it, uh, you know, facing burnout mm -hmm. and kind of realized it's time to change. Yeah. So what were some of the first steps you took? I started by really understanding that the impact of what you take in as what you put in your mouth um, has a huge effect. So cleaning out my diet, making sure that I wasn't eating things that was as they call it in the biohacking world, kryptonite for you. Mm. you know, I, I found out rather quickly that there was a lot of things I was eating that was less optimal for me. What could I say of that be? Beer was the first thing I cut out. <clears throat> uh, I love beer and I still do. I still drink beers from time to time, but way less. And I'm very selective with the type of beer I drink. 
uh, the yeast in G in beer is is you know almost like as I know you've done an episode on mushrooms, right? I mean yeast and and fungi and all those kind of uh, you know natural chemicals have a huge effect on your biology, not at least your brain. So you know um, from drinking a whole bunch of beers every time I went out partying to now only drinking gin or vodka, straight up gin and vodka with ice. That's my favorite poison of choice today, uh, simply because I know that I can get the buzz from drinking, but I won't get any of negative side effects, which means, you know, hangovers is something I only get if I drink beer, basically. Mm. Cool. So anyway, cleaning up my diet was the first, you know, uh, first step. And then starting to realize that there was different, what I would call um, energy sources in your body that you could tap into. And many people go through life just understanding nothing but, oh, I need to eat my carbohydrates. I need to eat my you know, my, my pasta and my bread and, you know, to keep the machinery running. And once you realize there's an alternative fuel source, which is fat, uh, namely the fat you keep around your your belly and all of the other store fat you have in your body as an alternative, you know, fuel source, which is way more potent, more like rocket fuel. That was the next step I took. Hmm. Cool. So we can talk a lot about biohacks. Yeah. And we already discussed several things and I've always learning from you when we uh, we've discussed these subjects but we talked about that today we're going to focus on how do you how do you stay optimal performance when you travel so much because you have around 100 travel days a year yeah that's been the arx the last seven years pretty much um i will say it's it's a little bit more this year actually so this year i'm really i'm really digging in deep on all my techniques and i'm constantly refining my travel protocol because it is as many other things uh, it's a journey about you know you're learning constantly and i think an important trait of a biohacker is that you listen to your body you you really you know make your own body almost like an antenna or radar screen where you constantly observe what's happening what's the impact of what you do um what you do con- kind of consciously and subconsciously right so with travel, to be specific on that, I've quickly learned that, you know, cleaning up your diet and timing your meals to the time zone you're traveling to is a, is a very important and, and, you know, first step. Um, and I, So cleaning up your diet, how do you do that when you travel? Because that's you, often where you get crappy food. Yeah, you just don't eat, basically. Yeah. You know, when I travel, I don't eat. If I eat anything, I carry a bag of nuts, so to speak. <laughs> um, namely, <laughs> macadamia nuts or, or cashews or some really clean nuts. Um, it's either that, or I boil some eggs from you know uh, before I, I leave home and I bring them with me. Um, not always the smartest move to open some pre-boiled eggs in the business mm-hmm. class, uh, you know, seating on an SAS airplane. People kind of look at you, but. I don't really care uh, because lots of the food they serve, even on business class, which I am really, really grateful that I'm uh, allowed to to travel on that. That does help a lot with getting sleep in when you're traveling. Um, but, you know, the food they serve on planes, you know, it's it's well known that the, your, your taste buds are numbed when you're in uh, basically in an airplane due to the different cabin pressure and stuff like that. So... In order for the food to taste good, they put in all sorts of food enhancers and MSG and all sorts of crap that basically will just irritate your gut. And many people have, you know, observe that when they travel to another time zone, for more than just an hour or two, your the first reaction is going to be constipation, right? And I had that for many years. And you know, when you're constipated, your body is not performing well, mm. and that is kind of knocking on several days from an effect perspective. So cleaning out the diet, you know, is about the easiest way to do that when traveling is not eating. And when you do arrive at your destination, you time your first meal with when you get up. So usually that will be your morning meal, the, the day of arrival. So, so um, for the people that love to eat and yeah. get hangry, what do you do? See, that's is where, that? you know, uh, dipping into ketosis or understanding that you don't die if you don't eat, right? The human brain is uh, very fond of a, a constant pleasure, right? And uh, understanding that the human humans were born to go without food for a long period of time. And if you if you want to read up on the literature and, and the, the kind of the history of it, there is um, there's still some tribes in in the jungles today and in Africa that 
that go hunting for days with nothing but water, right? And yet they're able to uh, to basically run down and uh, you know uh, antelope or something else that they're hunting down just on water. Right? And the way they do that is that they prime themselves for the hunt by not eating a lot or by eating a lot of protein or fat, mainly fats. Uh, it could be you know, insects or whatever that's usually got a high amount of protein and fat in them. And when doing so, your body naturally flop, kind of flip flops between carbohydrate and fat burning. It takes a couple of days, but once you're in fat burning, it is really like rocket fuel. And it's, it's hard to describe. If you haven't tried, I'll, I'll really encourage you to do so because the first time I tried forcing my body into ketosis by eating a whole lot of fat. It was like, it was this, they call it brain fog. And it's, it's really the way to describe it. It was like, all of a sudden the sky above you was blue and light and you had so much energy that it was really hard to control. That is the state that a hunter in, in various tribes, even in today's world, go into before hunting, which make them ultra clear in their mind, ultra focused. They don't think about food. They don't get hangry to, to use mm -hmm. that term. They basically just go, oh, I have one mission right now and I'm going to focus on that because I have the energy to not be distracted. So, so that's really, um, you know, one of my hacks when traveling. It's, it's ketosis. Yeah. And just a short word. <clears throat> what is ketosis? Ketosis is basically when you're burning fat for fuel. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a metabolic process um, that uh, taps into... Your, your fat stores on your body and it converts fat into ketones, which is basically your, your fuel then rather than glucose, right? Cool. So, so yeah, carrying on with the travel techniques and mm -hmm. strategies. I mean, um, usually I travel to the US probably at, at least uh, once a month in average. And um, I'm, I guess I'm proud to say I hardly ever get, you know, uh, jet lag. I've just been on three weeks pretty much back to back travel. Toronto, then London, then California, then London, and then back here last night. And I have not had a single sleepless night. I've not had a single issue with, with um, jet lag. And a lot of people ask me how I can do that. And I, it's really become one of those Superman things that compared to my colleagues, you know, I'm the one who can stand up all day in a meeting room and run the show uh, without any problems. Uh, whereas, you know, they will be worn out and tired and hangry and you know it's really just a different energy level that you are able to show up with and i think the main contribution there is is the the um the ketosis but it's also sleep hacks right mm. so talk a lot about sleep when you talk about biohacking and you know making sure that you get enough good sleep which is really really hard but doing simple things like sleep with earplugs when you're sleeping in a hotel in a different setting you know, even the slightest little noise, you know, your brain is constantly on alert because you're in a new environment. So you, if you are on that in that alert stage, you easily wake up, right? Put in some earplugs, put on some... <coughs> what kind know, of earplugs are we talking? The good old yellow ones? The good old yellow up? ones, <coughs> yeah. The ones where that's going to be filling out your ears so much that it will drag out all the earwax when you pull them out. Yeah. It's a good way to clean your ears as well. Um, Kidding partly there, but you know, they really got to be, you know, super tight. Uh, some will use some of these more silicon based uh, earplugs. They're good as well. It's really also a matter of preference. What matters is that they don't annoy you, right? So you're yeah. able to sleep through the night. So I always sleep with earplugs. I always do a whole bunch of things to make the room dark and make the room cold as well. The human body sleeps best between, is it like 16 and 19 degrees? So that range there. Celsius. Celsius, yeah. So um, I keep my room super cold and I sleep like a baby. Cool. So, And how do you make the room dark? Uh, so there's often a lot of artificial light. It's often that you can't yeah. really block out the, the windows fully and so on. So I am one of those guys who will wear, you know, blue blockers uh, when I'm traveling. Especially blue blockers? What is that? Blue blockers is a, it's a special type of lens that's become quite popular, especially in the US and the UK. And it's, it's happening in Denmark right now as well. That people are wearing these yellow tinted glasses that does nothing but, but filter off the blue light spectrum in, in the natural light. The LED glasses. Exactly. So LED lights today um, in the modern world are, you know, we're basically blasting out blue light, blue light, blue light. Same blue light as you have on laptop screens and phone screens. Which is one of the problems that I usually try and recommend uh, friends to to look into with their kids as well. That you know, a lot of screen time uh, for kids is not a good idea because you know 
the, the fact that blue light is almost like the, the if you imagine the brightest daylight you can imagine, right? And it's even worse than that. If you're bombarded with that just before sleep, or your natural circadian rhythm, your natural body clock, as we call it in Denmark, it's just it's it it's whacked out of space, and and you don't naturally go into a sleepy stage of producing melatonin that's going to put you to sleep and so on. So it it's kind of interrupting your natural processes. Uh, so wearing these blue blocking glasses um, helps. Uh, it it's you know it's hard to say it helps a lot, but it certainly helps. And that's the other thing about biohacking. It you know. It's for some it's about changing things radically. In my case, it's about really adding a whole bunch of small things together into something that has an enormous compound effect. Um, so a lot of small things all together, uh, you know, makes a big difference. So blocking out the blue lights before you go to bed also important when you travel. In a hotel room, it's a matter of all the little lamps, and you know, the first thing I do when I get into a hotel room is take the uh, the power out of the alarm clock, so there's nothing yellow <coughs> or green or red blinking in my eyes when I'm trying to sleep. You know, the TV, I unplug the TV, so there's no LED there, and everything that's got a little light on it, I unplug it or you know, cover it up with a towel or whatever I can find. So that's it. Cool. So cold room, dark room, dark room. Yep. Anything else under the earplugs? Um, recently, I've been experimenting a little bit with CBD oil, but that's a rather new <laughs> thing in my in my protocol. It had a profound effect to actually to a point where I missed a meeting, I missed a morning coffee in London last week. Pretty embarrassing. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it was with a or not. Hopefully, it was luckily <clears throat> with a good friend. Um, yeah. So it, it wasn't wasn't bad. It really put you. To sleep, I probably took too much CBD. Yeah. How so, do you like, so you put it in water, or how does it work? Yeah. So, so CBD is uh, like many other substances, by the way, um, quite vulnerable and does not comply well with your stomach acid. So you gotta, you know, make sure you carry it or, you know, uh, ingest it with a little bit of fat. So it's encapsulated by the fat cells. So I took it um, sublingual, which is under my tongue. Basically, you drip. CBD oil hmm. had a little bit of lavender in it as well, which is kind of a relaxing effect on on the um, uh, lavender oil there. But it, then I had about a teaspoon of coconut oil that I put in with, with it, and just under your tongue, under my tongue. Yeah. So you had uh, CBD oil. Yep. You had some lavender oil. Yep. And then you had a teaspoon of coconut oil. Yep. Just lying under the tongue. For about five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And it was uh, probably around 20 milligrams of CBD. Yeah. And I slept really well to a point where um, I woke up when my alarm went off and I just naturally snoozed my alarm. <laughs> I, say, I do that quite frequently, by the way, snooze my alarm. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, I snoozed it about five times yeah. <laughs> without even knowing. So anyway. Um, so what did you sleep say that night? So you have the aura ring, I know that. Yep. <clears throat> which is one of the best sleep trackers. Do you it remember is. what it said about your sleep that night? I could look it up, but it was rather good. It was like one and a half hour of deep sleep that night. Yeah. yeah. So definitely, uh, you know, put my entire body, body at rest. So. Yeah. Cool. Any other things for traveling and not getting, getting jet lag? So we talked a little bit about the alcohol already, yeah. and I'll say in the in the so world drinking a lot of champagne on the plane. Drinking a lot of champagne yeah. is always a good idea. <laughs> no, totally kidding. I I find it rather um, funny actually that uh, when you when you're in my line of work, it is the natural um, behavior just to you know self medicate a little bit. Because it is a hard job. It's a it's a quite rewarding job I have as well. You meet a lot of interesting people. You deal with a lot of interesting problems on a daily basis. Um, unfortunately, the entire consulting world is also one that is uh, in you know includes a whole bunch of you know nice dinners and as such alcohol, right? So again, back to my earlier point, finding out what your body can deal with and again if you want to manage your energy the day after a big dinner with lots of alcohol you know don't go drink a bunch of beers and don't drink a bunch of cocktails right that you know either because of the sugar content or because of the yeast in the beer or whatever it may be that's going to whack you out of uh, sync the, the following day i really really i'm mindful of that 
to a point where some of my colleagues have started to listen, which is really, really, I'm, I'm so pleased. It's one of my missions in life. It's to help other people, right? Mm. And, um, and those of us who are now pure gin drinkers, um, we deal a lot better with uh, the following day's energy than those who are not. And, and that's funny. So, so really, you know, on planes, I don't drink. End of story. Uh, but again, you see a lot of people around you in the cabin that will like, oh, free booze, I've got to drink this. I have to drink because it's free, right? Mm. It's like, well, yeah, if you want to feel like shit tomorrow, then have at it, mate. It's not, not my strategy, right? Um, and the same with, with like corporate dinners, etc. I mean, it is really just a culture, right? I'm, I'm hopeful that the culture is changing. I, I do think that there is a lot of people that are starting to listen to all my, my crazy talk. Um, funny enough, it's... Um, <clears throat> it's not who you would expect. Many people will uh, kind of, when I talk to them about biohacking, it's like, oh yeah, I've done Ironmans as well. I train a lot. It's like, well, yeah, I've been there. That's great. But it's also a huge stressor in life to, to you know, continue to train and train and train and train just to be able to convince yourself and continue to convince yourself that you can do an Ironman. I'm like, I've done half an Ironman once. It wasn't a great time, but I did it. I'm like, job done. I can move on to my next uh, challenge, right? But those who are in that corporate world today who continue to go Iron Man, Iron Man, Iron Man, Iron Man, that's kind of become the gold standard these days. Those are also the people who are dealing a lot with adrenal fatigue and just general fatigue because they overtrain, right? And those are the guys who will also, and I say guys, because those are the, the stereotype that I'm unfortunately surrounded with most times, um, they will go, oh yeah, I can drink all night and I just need to hit the gym for two hours tomorrow morning and then I'm good. And I go, yeah, one day you'll learn, mate, because that is the most stressful thing for your body to do. And if you look at your data, if you look at your biometric data, you know, your heart rate is going to go up significantly at a, at, at a unhealthy rate when you go train so hard a day after, you know, um, a day after drinking. Mm. So anyway... I go on and on about that. But, yeah. uh, <clears throat> so we're talking about not eating on the plane because the food is quite bad. Yep. It messes up your microbiome. It's about getting the earplugs, making sure the room is dark and cold. Yep. Anything else in regards to changing the, the sleep rhythm and so on? Not really, no. Um, I think that the biggest thing there is when you're in the new time zone, adjust to the time zone as quickly as possible. Um, there are some more, what I would call, alternative strategies that are less researched. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to let people know that I do use grounding as well, which is one of those, you know, a little bit woo-woo things that mm -hmm. are hard to, um, to justify with science. But nevertheless, there is absolute science behind, you know, grounding yourself to the environment you're in. So the earth frequency the sh is it called the Schumann frequency, right? So let's just explain what is grounding. Grounding is basically when you um, either via uh, so-called grounding mats, which by the way is a very well-known uh, cancer treatment protocol in Switzerland and yeah. Germany, grounding mats, basically, um, uh, decharging or discharging, sorry, your body from all of the um, the positive ions build up inside your body as you go and walk around this you know constantly electrified environment that we're in. You sleep next to your Wi-Fi router. You you know sit in a car that's totally electric and all those things. That's just kind of charging your body in a way it's not you know genetically or uh, biochemically built to do. Your body operates on, on basically electrical currents, right? So you, I normally say your body is an electrochemical machine. And if you start to alter the frequencies in your body, then naturally, you know, your cells are going to spin at a different frequency, right? So grounding is where it's almost like, you know, why does animals sleep on the ground? The human body was built to sleep on the ground. We, we were, we emerged from wherever we emerged sleeping in caves, right? We slept mm. on rock. Now, today you sleep in a highly electrified environment. It's just, I mean, I believe it's not good for you. And there's lots of signs at a uh, cellular level that, that talks to grounding, basically resetting your cellular frequency to a more natural state. Yeah, and grinding, just very low practical. It can be go outside, take your shoes off, yeah. take your socks off. Exactly. Just stand with your feet, bare feet, underground. Exactly. Yeah. And doing that when you travel is, yeah. is a really good uh, thing as well. I do that whenever I can, especially when I get home. 
um, socks off, out in the yard, 10 minutes, that's it. Yeah, cool. I've read about that several places as well, yeah. especially for jet lag. And I did it over the summer. I went out, started wow. in the morning, got the 20 minutes of sun yeah. to make sure I would get better sleep in at night. Yeah. And then uh, just bare feet. I mean, it feels weird, but uh, it actually feels Feel good. good, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's yeah. a weird thing, like, before you hear about it, before you try it, it actually feels good to stand there with, with your bare feet. That's yep. woo woo as it sounds. I'm sure some of my neighbors are well uh, familiar with the fact that when they see me standing bare feet in my yard with a yeah. cup of coffee, it's usually because I've just got home from the US. Yeah. So, well, if it works, it works. Yeah. Cool. So, we talked about discussing one other subject today, and that's the gene. Yeah. The gene. The gene, the motherfucker gene. Yeah. Can you uh, tell yeah. me about that? Yeah, absolutely. So one of my big discoveries in, in the my journey with biohacking, it, it's been the MGHFR gene uh, mutation that I have. And uh, I mean, it's, again, as you know, Mass, the, the, the world of biohacking is huge, right? And we haven't really talked much about how I define biohacking. But, you know, for, for me, just to take a side step there, it, it is really around optimizing your environment and your internal environment, your external and internal environment, to really focus on, you know, through, you know, nutrition, sleep, mind work, you know, exercise, as, as well as your productivity perspective that I know you're hot on, right? Um, you know, optimizing all of those aspects to reach the, the ultimate human performance level. So you can just charge through life and do the, the, the max amount of good for, for the world, basically, is, is my mission. So, uh, going back to genetic uh, gene mutations, you know, it's so easy today. It's become so easy and, and, and cheap. I mean, it's like $99 and then you have your, you know, a, a huge part of your genome data as a raw text file. Now that raw text file, you know, forget the uh, layman's deals in Denmark or the FDA in, in, in the US or where it may be, forget their approval systems, because if you're willing to learn, you basically take your raw DNA data from 23andMe, for instance, and you upload that into you know research databases, uh, you know uh, that basically is run out of Stanford University, or you take it to specified uh, you know specific doctors like Dr. David David Lynch, who's um, or Ben Lynch, sorry, I think David Lynch is an artist, isn't he? But anyway, Ben Lynch, mm -hmm. uh, he's also a bit of an artist, but it's in he's he's a doctor and he's he's written these protocols for. This specific gene mutation that I seem to have, which is basically downregulating my methylation process by seventy-five percent. Let's just how many people have this gene mutation? So, <clears throat> because it's one of those newly discovered areas that are you know still being researched quite a bit, and you know it, it, the numbers are you know uh, fluctuating a bit. But normally, you would hear that it's probably a quarter of all people. So a lot of people, a lot of these people, yeah, and the fourth person, yeah, most likely. That's to... that's the most severe um, uh, predisposition that that I seem to have as well. Where you have basically a bad copy of this gene from your mom and from your dad, so you got a double whammy of of negativity there, um, and that is, in my case, uh, severely hindering my absorption of B vitamins and folate. Uh, so B3, B9, B12, B6, uh, all those things are, that are hugely important for, for your gut and for your brain, not at least. I mean, this huge connection between gut and brain health that, that, that I'm, I am know you're aware of. Not many people are, but there's this gut-brain axis, which is you know recently proven in science. Um, it just really taught me so much that, wow, I was, I for, for starters, because of my gene defect, I need a lot more active B vitamins than the average person. And if I don't get that, along with folate, basically my brain activity is going down. And when I started to fix that and I started to take high dose vitamin B12 in active form, you know, again, it was like this light switch. The energy levels just went and up. B12, that's the, <clears throat> the vitamin or nutrition that a lot of uh, vegetarians are missing. Exactly, right? because they don't need a lot of, uh, you know, eggs and liver and stuff yeah. like that, that that contains it, right? So it's extremely important if you are a vegetarian. Yeah. I mean, the body also, you know, are able to produce B12, but you do need some of it and, and you need some of the precursors to produce it, um, you know, through your food, right? Yeah. So dialing in your diet there again and understanding you need to eat more eggs, you need to eat more dark leafy, uh, you know, vegetables and, and stuff like that in, in doses that are adequate for your... Um, 
your genetics is mm. basically important. Yeah. So yeah, the uh, the MTHRF gene mutation I carry the um, the so called C six seven seven T in a variation of that, which is um, not good. Yeah. So what have you been able to do about that? Well, and what should people listening here be like? Oh no, I'm not getting my vitamins. Like, what what can people do? Well, the f- the first thing they should do is to get their genetics profile. Um, either via 23andMe or you've got to make sure it's a service that, that allows you to take your raw data and export it yeah. because there are, to my knowledge, no officially approved uh, sites that will give you that analysis um, just, you know, just like that marker. Yeah. Some private clinics may do it, but the quickest way to do it is just go to 23andMe.com yeah. and buy the ancestral... DNA package. You could go with the Ancestral Plus Health package that they have. It's a little bit more expensive. I think it's 130 bucks or something uh, dollars that is, and that will give you some interesting insights into your risk of Alzheimer's, your risks of diabetes, your risk of, you know, whether you're, uh, you know, prone for uh, cardiovascular disease and certain types of cancers, etc. Right. But uh, it's still because it's such a new thing that that people are still getting their head around. You know, they do not do recommendation on, on this mm. um, motherfucker gene. But take your data, put it in uh, Prometheus, put it in stratgene.com, yeah. and just run it there. And it's one of those really, really... Um, we'll add some links in the show notes. Yes, <coughs> so people can find them. Yeah. So once you've done that, uh, again, the best source I could go to is stratgene, because then you pay, I think it was $25 or $35 maybe. And that will give you a very specific 20-page report on your very unique uh, genetics in relation to this specific methylation problem here. Uh, dialing it in is a very individual individual protocol and you really have to just read up on the literature there. Um, and the report you get will give you uh, specific targeted advice to, you know, do you need more B12? Do you need more folate? You know, what should you avoid eating? And, uh, and so on. Right? Cool. So what have you done? Well, to fix it. I've, I've uh, upped my B12 significantly, and um, the fun and scary story there is, as you know, my um, I've been tracking a lot of my blood biomarkers for the last many years, um, and at one point I I was taking B12 because I've read oh you should you know you should probably do more B12. It was before I really dived into the genetics defect here, um, and I, I I already took like a daily B12 supplement, and then I ran out. And I decided, ah, oh, it's probably not important. I mean, whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm going to eat a lot. That will naturally, you know, give me what I need. And then I noticed that my homocysteine, which is one of those they call them silent inflammation markers, uh, another one of things we don't in Denmark measure at all unless you're near death, right? Um, but homocysteine levels in my case were through the roof, like at a very alarming stage. And in in the UK and in the US and in Germany, I believe as well. Homocysteine is one of those things that they say, well, if it's high, you, it, it's, it correlates with the, the, uh, your overall risk of cardiovascular uh, you know, disease and basically fatal disease. So I was like, that's not nice because I was already eating a lot of fat and I had a lot of you know, uh, build-up cholesterol, which is a whole lot of story we can talk about another time. I'm not worried about that. Cholesterol is, is you know, vital for your brain. Um, but anyway, of course, you're being a biohacker, not a doctor, but you, you're starting to understand the system, right? You got a little bit curious and you say, oh, spoke with a doctor in the U.S. And he said, oh, your homocysteine really shouldn't be that high. There's something wrong there, right? So what I did then was I realized, oh, it's the B12. Because the B12 is really what helps to combat the homocysteine. So um, again, when I started taking B12, three months later, tested my blood again, homocysteine was totally normal. Right. So, again, it, it's one of those things where most people can go through life without realizing that. And I'm going to probably potentially uh, risk myself here a little bit by saying this. But but I would guess that in a few years time, we will find research outcomes that will uh, start to correlate some of these genetic defects, obviously, mm-hmm. um, with things like cardiovascular disease. At a, at a, at a, and it becomes much more easy to prevent yeah. getting those. So. Cool. And so, <clears throat> jumping on to next, what inspires you at the moment? What's some of the stuff in the biohacking community we like? That's interesting. 
Og stuff oh. that you're testing out at the moment, or wanna test out that you haven't uh, tested yet? Uh, that's a good question. I'll say what inspires me at the moment is is not actually a, a th- like a, a new hack. It's more that there is so much happening in this space right now, mm. yeah, and there are so many great people coming together in, in forming communities around this, and um, I'm really sensing so much energy, positive energy about biohacking and how, I mean, my network in the last uh, four or five months around biohacking globally has really, really exponentially grown to a level where I'm connecting with some very interesting people around the globe about this. Um, And we're all on this shared mission. We're all on this mission around, well, biohacking is a niche. It's for the geeks like myself. But it's time to really start talking more widely about this, especially in countries like in Northern Europe that are so regulated when it comes to health and, you know, um, really trying to democratize your access to this knowledge and allowing a system to flourish um, kind of on the side of the national healthcare system that can help people, right? Because it is so easy. It, 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 I'm, I'm really, really energized by the fact that once you understand a few things and, and more and more products and startups are going to come out of this industry, I can definitely tell that even in my own line of work at, at EY, I mean, the focus on consumer health, like consumer driven products that are leading to health, it's, it's growing exponentially right now. We call it Healthcare 4.0 where I work. And it, it's, you know, the pharmaceuticals know it, uh, you know, the, the big consulting firms know it. So when they start to pick up on this, it's happening, right? So when you ask what's, what's really inspiring right now, it's that movement. It's mm-hmm. the movement. It's the, it's the ripple effect of, of this whole, you know, uh, community. Cool. Do you have any routines that you do? <clears throat> so apart from when you travel, some routines for what to do. Any yeah. routines when you're at home or? Yeah, I... Um, I have a couple of uh, routines that people will probably think are a bit weird, but um, in my world, they make so much sense. And one of them is my morning routine, my, my really, really focused morning routine, um, which it's not, it's not like I do the same thing every morning, but I just make sure that every morning I get up at least half an hour before my wife, and I really try and, and have some me time. Yeah. Um, And I, I do that sometimes by basically just, you know, saving the dishes from the day before. And then I spend 15 minutes doing the dishes thoroughly, almost like a mindfulness practice, you know, cleaning the, the pans and, you know, wiping off the table and all those things very methodically. Uh, and it might, may sound a little bit OCD-like, uh, but it is really just a mindfulness practice. Other days, it's more I do my yoga routines that I, I do a couple times a week, which turns into to some meditation practice. So it, it you know... For me, there's not one thing. There are several protocols, and depending on my mood when I jump out of bed, that's what I do. Um, and then I will say my other little routine that I would recommend people to do is is get out in the wild and, and you know get into the forest to get out in the fields and go for a run, get some fresh air. It is profound what it does. I mean, go for a run in the city of Copenhagen. It's it's fine. You get some energy, but you know, having access to good quality air and, and you know, breathing in some some really good um, uh, air from the forest is, is something that I, I enjoy doing on a on a regular basis as well. Cool. It's also very big in Japan, for, forest bathing. Oh, that's <coughs> right. It's a whole medical field <laughs> where you actually... Is it? Yeah. Wow. So um, biophilia is, the, is a, it's a whole field about what nature does to uh, to the human body. Yeah. And in Japan they actually send people out in the in the in the forest if yeah. they have depression or other heart diseases and so on. That's a treatment protocol because it just it does something to the body. So Sounds yeah. like a very cheap uh, way to deal with with depression. Yeah. What's the pharmaceuticals going to live off then? That's uh, yeah, that's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, it hasn't come to Denmark yet, but um no. I heard a doctor as well prescribe surfing in French. Okay. So that was pretty interesting as well. But that's also getting out into nature. Yeah. Because it helps. And there's the whole mindful yeah. aspect of it as well. Well, there's a lot of things to do with breathing in air that's close to water, especially running water or, you know, waves. And again, the um, the, the iron composition, you know, whether it's positive or negative charge of the air is it matters a lot there. Um, 
and yeah so i mean the ideal place to live as a biohacker would be next to a, a big uh, like natural spring or waterfall or something like that right That'll be uh, that'll be fantastic. <clears throat> that would be a good place to move to. Wouldn't mind <laughs> moving to France and surf every day though. That would be nice. Yeah. yeah. So before we round off, where we hear like what's next for you, where you want to take this biohacking and potentially any last tips you have, or if you had to recommend one thing to do for biohacking or travel. Uh, I can recommend a lot of things, but I will say my the the, the two things I would recommend people to do yeah. uh, if they're interested in really optimizing their performance um, it is pay attention to your body almost make your own body a warning system at a very very finite level um, and and I, I mean that at a at a level where you know say you eat something and you you just start to pay attention to does that change your mood in any direction because usually that's where it happens first you know it takes about 20 minutes before something hits your stomach before your your system will, will you know either uh, alert itself or not right so pay attention to what happens when you eat things that's the first thing um, so creating that state of awareness is really the first step i would recommend people to practice on a daily basis um, and soon you'll find out that uh, if you try and cut out some things that you may cope just fine with like in my case it's it's bread i'm not a celiac or anything you know severe like that uh, and i can tolerate gluten quite well but i have also learned if i eat a lot of gluten like i used to i get constipated and i get hangry and i get mood swings and but you know yeah i learned to cope with that but i've just become a much nicer human mm -hmm. being after that ask my wife i mean she knows whenever i eat bread she'll go like ah don't do it you're gonna act like a jerk in a minute right yeah so and it, and it sounds weird because so many people have just learned to deal with it mm -hmm. and overcome it but there is another state of mind which you can tap into if you want to so that's the first thing it, it's pay attention to your body um the second thing is be curious right um, don't just go through life accepting that the norm is what the society has told you it's going to be. Be curious and go, well, actually, there may be a new norm for me that is better for me than for the average person that's statistically been you know, thrown into some recommendations that the society is going to give you, right? Um, I think with the access to today's uh, knowledge base through the internet and through YouTube and other channels that, of course, you got to be mindful of the quality of mm -hmm. the, the knowledge that you consume, right? Do your research thoroughly, but, you know, be curious and, and, and explore what the options are rather than just walk through life like a zombie, right? That would be my other thing. So, and then you ask, where's, where's this going to take us next? Um, it's an interesting question. And I think it is, um, it's probably one of my most what I would say, uh, driving forces in my life right now, it is to to make an impact in the world with this. Um, it might may, may sound in, in a Danish, uh, you know, term a little bit arrogant, and and you know, it's why I hate the law of Yente, by the way, because I believe everybody's got the potential to do a whole lot more than they think they they can. Um, so I want to <laughs> make a dent in the world with this for sure. Cool. Yeah, that's gonna be interesting to follow. I. Definitely believe that you have the potential of doing it and will be doing it the next uh, couple of years. So I'm glad to be on the sideline of following that. Yeah, I'm glad to have you with me here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where can people find more about you and follow you and read about what's going on? Well, I will say my two main uh, channels at the moment is uh, LinkedIn and Instagram. So just Google uh, Martin Kramer and you'll you'll find me there. Cool. Um, I and mean, the short note as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Well, Martin, thank you so much for spending some time with me today and uh, sharing with the listeners out there. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of Growth Island. Be sure to subscribe for more episodes on how to be the best version of yourself. And if you found this show helpful, then please leave us a review so more people will learn about the podcast or share with a friend who can benefit from it too. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.